Greetings and welcome to another iteration of my uh, occasional series perspectives. Today I am joined by one of the rarest of breeds out there, an authentic Georgian. Now, you tend not to encounter many Georgians in the world, probably because Georgia is a small country and there aren't many Georgians to begin with. So I thought it almost imperative to take the opportunity to discuss the country of Georgia. Uh, for a variety of reasons. It's reasonably unique. It has a reasonably unique language, and of course its history is very much intertwined uh, with that of 20th century history, political and otherwise. And of course Georgia's most uh, famous export is none other than Mr. Stalin himself. With that said, uh, I uh, will then hand the podium, or now hand the podium over to the uh, the base Georgian who will uh, introduce some of this. Now, I guess for I'm going to make the terrible assumption there actually might be some people in the audience who don't know what Georgia is or where it is. Georgia is a country uh, in the context of the so-called Caucasus Mountains. Uh, that is, uh, uh, it's uh, west. You could say Western Asia, uh, sort of. Uh, I guess it's difficult to describe, and. Um, yeah, it's, so it's actually a country. It's, I'm not talking about the state of Georgia in the United States. I, I'm assuming that actually nobody in the audience would get that confused. But And it has its own unique language. Uh, and with that said, yeah, again, the uh, the true Georgian. So, Well, hello. Hello. I am an authentic Georgian. And, um, well... Uh, you mentioned that uh, people tend to confuse Georgia with the states in the United States, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I lately, not. lately that has not been my experience. Lately, people have been able to uh, immediately tell where I was from when I told them that I'm from Georgia. Well, yeah. it was a delightful surprise, to be honest. So we're we're making progress in terms <clears throat> of geographical knowledge. Well, that's good. Sure, sure. Uh, in uh, well, in two thousand and eight, Georgia became uh, came to the center of the spotlight. Right, uh, there was a conflict with uh, Russia, and uh, at that time, uh, Georgia was, I guess, in the same shoes as Ukraine is now in terms of uh, media attention. Yeah. Well, uh, what uh, as a Georgian, how I mean, it's obviously a difficult task, but. How would you describe Georgia? Because Georgia is obviously its uh, <clears throat> its own place. You have a, a unique language that is uh, apparently, is based on my uh, knowledge or looking into it, is unrelated to other languages. Uh, has a unique script. Uh, you kind of exist unto yourself. You have a history with the Soviet Union, or you were part of the Soviet Union, but no longer. So. What is Georgia, exactly? Well, um, that's a good question. Uh, we are, uh, in Georgia, we are trying to find out ourselves. If you look at the history of Georgia, our history has been uh, that of trying to deal with outside conquerors and try to uh, uh, ensure that we are able to live as we see fit for ourselves, that we are masters of our own destiny. <clears throat> If you look at, uh, uh, if you ask me what is Georgia for me, well, first and foremost, it's my home. But if you ask what is Georgia right now, geopolitically speaking, without a doubt, it's a satellite state, unfortunately. As of I, the, 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 sorry, the Soviet, of Russia? No, not neither of Russia nor of the United States. The huh. thing is... Uh, there are different forces right now trying to uh, wage their satellite battle in uh, Georgian government. You have on one side people who have uh, graduated in uh, the United States or have uh, had their education at the Central European University, the new elite, so to speak. And uh, on the other side, you have some uh, populist politicians trying to utilize this uh, populist uprising in Europe as uh, some form of uh, 
uh, let's say, to kindle the nationalist sentiments. And for this, the context is important. You see, in the 90s, when Georgia first uh, gained their independence, there was a putsch, an overthrow, uh, and a military overthrow. And uh, after this military overthrow, our uh, democratically elected president was substituted by a former Soviet official, Eduard Chavarnadze, who then became president. And during that time, we had Russian uh, military bases in Georgia. And, uh, well, uh, the Russia exerted a lot of influence on the country. But uh, after uh, this guy t- tried to get elected for the third term, um, in 2003, there was uh, the so-called uh, Rose Revolution, a revolution without any blood, when this guy was uh, forced to resign and we had an election and a new government came to power. And to their credit, uh, at first, this government uh, did a lot of reforms in the country. They optimized the bureaucracy more or less, they uh, started to build uh, the infrastructure and uh, they, uh, well, as it usually is in nation building, like to, uh, they tried to reform the country. But then came a problem. You see, uh, these people had, uh, had their education taken outside the country and they tried to do a bit of uh, social engineering and do it a bit uh, too directly on one hand and people reacted negatively to it. On the other hand, you had uh, uh, a lot of what happened at that time was theatrics. Georgia was uh, supposed to be used as some sort of uh, model country for uh, reforms and democracy and uh, for a period of time it was being used like that uh, in the media. If they wanted to talk about an example of uh, a former Soviet Union uh, country uh, getting rid of corruption and uh, reforming uh, in a very quick pay, at a very quick pace, they always pointed to Georgia. But uh, all of that was uh, a facade. Uh, This uh, government was really uh, reliant on presenting to itself, to the uh, world, outside world, uh, differently than it really was. And, uh, well, to a certain end, but the reality for people who lived in Georgia was much different. Well, uh, we can go into many directions. From but, I mean, here. traditionally the... I mean, so you're using the term satellite almost in a new, new way, uh, because traditionally you would have some uh, some geopolitical power uh, or state that had, sub- you know, for example, you can argue maybe even to this day that South Korea is a satellite state of the United States. I mean, some people would dispute that, but, you know, you could make some kind of argument. Um, but you, you're, the way you're using satellite seems almost as if uh, you're describing... A satellite state of opposing political ideologies rather than actual uh, states themselves, uh, if I've understood you correctly. Sure, it's like, well, Georgia is uh, a neighbor, a direct neighbor to Russia, and uh, a third of our country is right now occupied by uh, the Russian military. Mm. So, uh, well, well, I guess that would be, in a sense, uh, you're right, yes, you're correct. I'm using the term satellite state as to um, denote the fact that these two governments are uh, trying to fight their battle on our soil using uh, different political parties. And uh, this is immediately visible if you look who is funding who and where do these people move and who they talk with and who they talk to. Like, um, one thing I noticed was that, uh, uh, well, there were sometimes uh, articles in Georgian press about certain government officials quickly vanishing from uh, the public uh, eyes, and uh, there were talks about how they were fired or how they uh, 
had some troubles at work and turns out these people were getting education in say Harvard and uh, well this is all publicly available information these people are uh, not elected officials they are like uh, government bureaucrats unelected people who do not usually change with the uh, change of governments they were uh, there during uh, this uh, national Georgian national movement this uh, party that came to power in 2003 and uh, they were uh, they are there right now but in a higher positions so and on the other hand you have uh, some political parties and also officials within this uh, current government of ours who come out with openly Russian sympathies and uh, they interact with, uh, they go to Russia, they interact with Russian officials a lot, uh, either openly or behind the scenes and uh, yeah, it's uh, better to say it's a battleground, I guess that would be a better, better uh, term. Question, and this might be a tangential point, but perhaps not. So obviously, given the history and the proximity, say, in, ed in the educational system, you, you would learn Russian. I know you speak Russian to some degree. Yes. Um, yes. In many places where, say, the former Eastern Bloc in, uh, in Europe, places like Hungary, Poland, etc., they would learn Russian too. But after the wall uh, fell, uh, as it were, the, the transition was to learning English as a global language. I'm just curious, in, in the education system, would you say that Russian still has great prominence or uh, English is the way to go? Oh, English is definitely the way to go, but uh, there are certain, I guess, idiosyncrasies which uh, would you would not uh, necessarily meet in uh, developed countries. Like, usually people don't learn the foreign languages at uh, schools. Uh, the teachers are greatly underfunded. Um, an average salary for a teacher is uh, around 250 Georgian lari. To put this in perspective, it is uh, a bit less than $100. A month. A month, yes. Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, <laughs> which I mean, if you live in the capital, which is quite an expensive area to live in, then this is uh, definitely not enough to support, have a decent lifestyle, and by decent I mean when you don't have to uh, just uh, buy food in grams and uh, you're able to pay your electricity bills and uh, so on. So uh, usually these teachers are overworked, under unmotivated, and uh, if anyone uh, learns a foreign language it is uh, due to private tutors. And, uh, well, the teachers found a good, great way to gain additional income. Uh, they get, uh, stu they get uh, well, private students to teach them the English language. Well, there is also another problem on top of this. Most of these people, when they studied uh, English, they did not uh, study how to teach. They studied more like literature. And because the USSR was isolated, more or less, uh, many of these teachers don't uh, speak proper English. So it is, uh, you have a situation when uh, the supply of uh, good English teachers is small, and uh, <laughs> that uh, means that uh, learning a foreign language is uh, quite a costly uh, privilege in the country. Mm -hmm. So how, how did you, did you learn English from the internet uh, primarily? Oh, well, I happen to be from the more privileged class. I see. Thanks. To, yeah, thankfully. Uh, okay. But, uh, but uh, if you are asking about the formal education in the country, well, formally you get schools where they teach English predominantly and sometimes also Russian. This is like an artifact because uh, you can't just, uh, the mentality is you can't just fire all those Russian teachers and that's why most of them just remain. But, uh, well, uh, I don't know how uh, this uh, will change in say 10 to 20 years because, well, because of uh, 
not so well thought out reform in the education system. Uh, right now, Georgia has a severe lack of supply of uh, younger teachers. Well, uh, abs good lack of good pay is also one thing, but uh, on the other hand, uh, Georgia right now lacks institutions and special programs who are dedicated to pumping out uh, teachers in general. So I don't know, but these people who teach Russian are all quite old, and in 10 or 20 years, I guess we're going to see a, lack, a big lack of uh, teachers in public schools. Hmm. Uh, and this is because uh, because oh. they're, they're, uh, the underfunding and the lack of pay. Yes, also one, on one side, underfunding and lack of pay, and uh, on the other side... Uh, well, uh, okay, let's talk about the education reform then. Uh, why was it that the national uh, movement got uh, disgraced in the country? Because at first they got into power with above 90% votes. This is a very high uh, trust for any political party. But then, well, they wanted to reform the education system. But uh, in order to reform education system, you have to be very, very careful, right? Because uh, academia itself is uh, a creature of its own. And instead of trying to surgically remove people and get uh, uh, people who were aware of the uh, intricacies of this uh, uh, beast, they tried to, uh, <laughs> they did it very bluntly. And uh, because they did it bluntly, the good people who were in the uh, academia, who were uh, doing some legitimate academic work, they also felt compelled to uh, defend the institution as a whole. This was uh, seen as an attack on the institution of higher education. And, um, well, this ended up in a lot of professors getting fired, and uh, many of them then... Uh, could not handle the emotional pressure and uh, got heart attacks and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was that bad. Like uh, the first, uh, well, after the first uh, rude reform, they decided to, uh, the professor decided to hold uh, the uh, director of uh, the oldest Georgian university accountable and they decided to have a meeting with him and they were greeted with police officers. Hmm. Well, they, well, many of them felt very, this was very demeaning. They thought, we are not bloody hooligans, what are you doing to us? But, well, I guess there is also this mentality in the young people, or at least the foreign educated people, that uh, if something was done in the, uh, in the USSR, or if a guy got his PhD in USSR, therefore it must have been necessarily bad. But uh, the thing is, these people are usually either law students or uh, political science students, and political science and law in USSR was what? Scientific communism and uh, uh, <laughs> political economy, basically the Soviet equivalent of what is right now in the West, uh, gender studies and... Uh, <laughs> uh, social justice gender studies yes this huh. is well uh, yeah well in the USSR there was a lot of purity spiraling you had a certain type, class of people in the academia who were titled red professors uh, who got PhDs in quite frivolous fields like history of the political party in uh, the USSR and there was only one political party that was the Communist Party and all they had to do is just sit down and learn what kind of meeting happened when and if you look at those names of those committees they are incredibly long incredibly boring you can tell uh, one uh, apart from the other one and usually people who got into high positions in the country when to get degrees in these fields or, well, if not in history of political party, then in general history. And uh, generally in just history. 
and uh, well uh, these people also had to ensure that uh, to keep the intellectuals the professors in line at universities well uh, and if you wanted to be uh, free more or less in the humanities you had to either uh, act as if you were crazy or you had to go to gulag and there was a guy for instance who in order to keep his academic freedom he used to act crazy with his colleagues but not with his students he used to like wear different pairs of shoes and uh, <laughs> very unmatching clothes all the time and people looked at him and were like okay he's just crazy and didn't uh, pay attention to him but uh, the case was a bit different for the more stem fields because you can say whatever you want about the ussr but it was not a banana republic right it was not a underdeveloped uh, country they had some technology because uh, after all they sent people to space right uh, the thing is in the 30s after the repressions when these uh, red professors these uh, frivolous uh, fields came and uh, forcibly infiltrated so to say the academy or forcibly went into this academia after some time uh, people up there the most notable Georgian Stalin realized that he needed some tech to fight wars, to build the country, and yeah, to keep the country going. And after that, uh, the STEM fields got uh, a lot of attention in uh, the country. So that's why, uh, regardless of what was happening in this uh, in this humanities. Uh, or better to say this frivolous part of the quote-unquote humanities uh, STEM was going fairly well and uh, you had the occasional uh, just uh, I, this either a physicist or a mathematician uh, just not being very aware of uh, this what was uh, permissible to speak and what, uh, say and what was not permissible and sometimes getting sent to uh, evening schools in history of political party and so on <laughs> this is this is actually a thing they sent uh, some professors for uh, quote unquote re-education to learn more about history because these people were more or less isolated and the story goes like the first dissenter uh, or the leader of the dissenter movement Sakharov the guy who came up created the Russian atomic bomb he was fairly apolitical. The way he got into politics was that he was, as a member of some committee which you were obliged to be a member of, he had to make a presentation about uh, uh, socialism and communism. And he was not very aware of uh, how the communist world worked. And when he, he sat down and uh, learned about it, he became a dissenter. Hmm. Now, you've mentioned, in, at least in passing in recent times, that, uh, well, you use the example of satellites, but that some of the uh, trends that you see in the West, especially in the United States, and I suppose to a lesser extent in Europe, social justice and the, that sort of thing that th these have been uh, the uptake uh, or uptick rather in in, in Georgia uh, and if only because of these the sort of ideological satellites maybe you can go you mentioned as well for example that uh, university education rather than being uh, the object or the uh, the doorway for people who are qualified increasingly is becoming, as is presented in the United States, this universal. Everyone goes to university, and as a consequence, the the quality has uh, gone down. So, yes, yeah. exactly. Well, uh, I guess there is another factor to the equation in Georgia that uh, Georgia is a poor country compared to the United States with, uh, I mean, 
of course, much poorer. Like Harvard University's uh, yearly budget is greater uh, than I think Georgia's GDP. Okay. So that's interesting. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, you have uh, well. I guess it's also, to a certain extent, a cultural thing that everyone wants their uh, child to have a degree as some sort of uh, token. And on the other hand, the government uh, stopped funding the institutions of higher education. So you have these uh, institutes who are... Instead, it went into this scholarship program where everyone who graduates this uh, scholarship the school, everyone who graduates the school, they have to take part in some national exams and then uh, accord base as kind of like an SAT course in the United States, I guess. But uh, the difference being that instead of uh, you have you have to write exams in four different fields. One is, uh, I guess, something of, like an IQ test. Another is uh, a Georgian literature and history than a foreign language and the specific uh, subject that you want to study at the university. These four. And uh, you have to do these exams and if you fall, fail to go above certain barrier, then you don't get to go to the university. Now, the problem with this is since the universities are now self-funded, they rely on student funding. So the universities have been uh, putting pressure on the government to uh, make the tests a bit more simple than they, uh, so that more people get to uh, pass these tests and they go to any of the universities because uh, yeah, they need people to sustain their uh, livelihood, the universities, I mean. And uh, on the other hand, you have some cases when uh, uh, people, this is also, uh, I guess, a bastardized approach to uh, liberal arts, where you think that if you uh, you do not care how what kind of education people got in uh, high school, you only want them to get to the university level, and you will teach them well anything that uh, they anything that they want, and this is just a lie. Like uh, I guess, uh, I guess people uh, could market this to. Uh, well, no one in the elite schools markets it like that in the United States. At least that's what I'm sure of. What you study in uh, your high school is also very important. So these people, instead of asking uh, for uh, the specific uh, exam that is necessary to study in this program at the university, just to increase the number of students, they have said, okay, we're going to take in absolutely anyone. So some, not all, some universities. So you get a situation where people who have studied history uh, decide to go to computer science just because, well, this is the only place that will accept them. And uh, <laughs> I mean, getting that, uh, university degree is important after all, right? All right, And things would not be as uh, bad if uh, you just absolutely needed to pass these exams to get to universities. The problem is you don't. There is a loophole in, this, uh, in the rules where you can uh, get accepted in Ukraine in some uh, very questionable university and then transfer uh, your... Uh, documents to some Georgian university and voila, you're a student. You didn't need to pass this, uh, pass any of the exams. Mm. So yeah, on top of being, uh, on top of being uh, uh, not making any sense uh, in terms of, uh, well, uh, quality control also, the system does not seem to be fair. Oh yeah, and also in Georgia, uh, males usually get drafted, so sometimes, uh, or I guess a lot of times, this uh, univer getting, getting to a university, even a low-tier university, is just a way to avoid uh, compulsory military service, because uh, usually they don't, uh, 
they don't uh, give you any training at all. They just uh, use you as uh, uh, well. They just use you as uh, free uh, labor. Like uh, there were some lawsuits in recent years uh, with the rationale that uh, you have to either uh, get rid of compulsory military drafting or you have to uh, <laughs> you have to draft females as well. And uh, funny enough, at first, the uh, response from the government was that uh, females are not strong enough to be drafted for the military. Well, I don't know how that would fly in modern, in uh, this current environment right now. But uh, the last time it happened, the response was that they do not uh, have the necessary means to... Uh, pay for this labor that they get freely from the force, uh, from compulsorily drafted uh, people. And uh, when you hear re reports that uh, most of the government officials in the country uh, get uh, special premiums and bonuses every month, as if they are doing some uh, extra work, this is uh, this seems to be <laughs> especially enraging because I could understand uh, wanting to go to the compulsory military draft to serve your country to protect it, but you don't even do that. All you do is work for some government bureaucrat to get a higher bonus. Mm. Oh yeah, and uh, I guess that is also another thing. Georgia has formally like 16 percent unemployment rate, which I call bullshit because the way this uh, this unemployment is uh, computed uh, is quite uh, well. It's quite fraudulent in a sense because uh, they count everyone who uh, farms. Who has even a little bit small land where he farms some uh, vegetables for himself as self-employed yeah so absolutely everyone is self-employed and uh, this and if you discount these self-employed people then uh, the government workers constitute around 30 40 or 45 percent of the whole <laughs> workforce which is a disaster well, it seems to me uh, it's not too dissimilar that uh, during, probably still, but during the quote-unquote Great Recession, um, there are people, I was underemployed, but there were people who were heavily underemployed, you know, working 10, 12 hours a week because that was all that was available, but they were still counted as fully employed people. And I think governments do all kinds of things to, uh, I guess, polish the numbers or the percent. So it, it seems to me that, it doesn't surprise me that the Georgian uh, government would, would sure. go about it this way either. Sure, but uh, the context is that if you discount the self-employed people, the unemployment rate goes up to 70%. S 17. 70. 70. Oh, yes. That's, uh, some... Yeah, that's a disaster. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that, that, that's bad. That's yeah, bad. I know. Yeah. <laughs> It's really bad. I get the impression that, you know, well, it's obvious given your field of study, you know, number th you're an outlier in many ways. Do you, uh, you seem to have, I guess, for lack of a better terms of nationalist aspirations of improving in Georgia, yet you're an incredible outlier, obviously, both in your personal capacities and, uh, you know, the, the fortunes that uh, the fates have heaped upon you. Uh, do, do you, despite your nationalist uh, aspirations, don't, don't you see a kind of disconnect between you and the vast majority of your fellow Georgians? Yes, unfortunately, well, I do. I do and I don't in a sense. Well, I do in a sense that I look at things a bit differently than my fellow Georgians, but uh, I still tend to think that uh, the young people at least... Even those who are uh, acting against the Georgian interest, they still believe that they are doing something good for the country. Uh, that's, uh, well, 
at least some of them. Like, uh, the context is important, right? And the context in this case is that most of these uh, young people, well, if you look at what kind of education system they have gone through, it is remarkable they are even able to put uh, two sentences together. Like, that's my impression. Like, I, w I was very fortunate because of my parents. Uh, they try to take care of my education uh, really, really well, but uh, at, at least as, they, as well as they could. But, well, if you, if you have these uh, people, if the public discourse about uh, the foreign policy is uh, on the level of Russia bad, uh, America good, or America bad, Russia good, you, mm, you're not going to get very far, right? Because most of these young people think that, uh, or I guess sincerely believe that uh, getting somehow integrated into this uh, European bureaucracy is a way to uh, develop the country. Our uh, public discourse is more or less dominated by discussion of uh, foreign policy. And uh, I guess there are very few people who uh, think uh, that, uh, well, instead of having to choose whose satellite state we are going to be, we have to be thinking that uh, we have to take care of ourselves on our own. I guess this is missing greatly from, uh, from, the public, from people, and especially young people. Like, uh, I mean, Russia and uh, the United States and Europe are only interested in uh, Georgia as long as it's in the, I mean, as long as they can get something out of it, right? I mean, who is foolish enough to think that uh, foreign policy is conducted by feelings and uh, ethics as you would treat a person? Like, I mean, that, that's not how the game is played. Hmm. But... Um, but none, well, none of uh, none of what none of the picture that you've painted really uh, seems to be a a positive one. It seems that I mean, for example, r real unemployment being at seventy percent. Uh, I mean that is, as you point out, catastrophic. In addition, uh, I just I know it's not a positive one, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, well, no, it, it, it seems that, 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 that maybe Georgia is affected by, I don't like to use the term insurmountable, but just almost or nigh insurmountable problems. And that, uh, I mean, I, I, I find it puzzling, maybe, and this is obviously a, a matter of opinion, but you seem to me the type of person who... Uh, could have much better opportunities outside of, of Georgia. Sure. And, uh, you know, the, the alt-right would famously say brain drain, right? But, and maybe that's true, but do you think you'd ever reach the point where you think Georgia's a hopeless case and you, you're just better off seeking your fortunes elsewhere? Or do you want to fight with your dying breath to improve the country even if a the task, it seems, at least appears to me to be almost insurmountable. Uh, I, okay. Mm, I can't be sure. I mean, depends. If I get older, like if I reach my 40s or 50s and get a family and I'm more uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, preserving my family, then it could be because I've seen cases of this that... Uh, a lot of people who were in the dissident movement, like my parents' generation, they held these huge aspirations. And uh, when I look at them, I see a lot of broken people who used to have hope, but now they have lost it. But, um, but, uh, well, if you look at history of Georgia, most of the time it was a small group of people taking on the responsibility to do something good for the country and you can still do something good for the country even if you are not uh, in the country like there are i mean there are some georgian professors spread out 
in the United States and in Europe having positions and they themselves try to, well, if they see it, like a Georgian guy wants to get a PhD and, uh, well, let's not be very, uh, let's not uh, <laughs> hold, let's be delusional here. Personal connections are very important when getting uh, a position in modern academic world. Well, they could be like a pathway for these highly skilled people to um, get to these places. Like they, on one hand, help the brain drain, but on the other hand, uh, Georgia has uh, one of the highest return rates of its Erasmus uh, scholarship holders and uh, also uh, scholarship holders of German Academic Exchange Service. I see. Young people, well, I guess that is one thing uh, that you, uh, I mean, I guess this is a matter of cultural perspective. Like, if you study your history and you, your country has been about self-determination, that the central theme almost always is to be independent and to uh, be a uh, master of your own destiny. Like, uh, that it's up to you how you decide to live, what you want, um, what you do with your country, and you'd rather go hungry than just uh, uh, <laughs> be bred into a submissive cattle. Uh, for some other place, then I find it difficult for someone to look at this, to identify with this, and then be like, oh no, I just care about my own fucking stomach. I, I find that uh, stra hard to believe and hard to... Well, uh, if anything, <laughs> you seem to be pretty aware, maybe even hyper aware of uh, some of the problems that George is facing. It's not as if you... It's not as if you're viewing the country with rose-tinted glasses. You're not saying, oh, well, I mean, if you're going to, if your your claim is correct, it's 70% on un real unemployment, and that's a huge problem. Uh, then there's a venality and corruption, all these things. So you're not, I mean, you realize that there's a huge mess that needs to be cleaned up. I mean, if, uh, I guess Jordan Peterson would be saying that Georgians need to clean their room. Sure. Uh, but okay, so, but it is my room. If I don't clean it, who else will clean it? Yeah, yeah. So I, I suppose you're you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, you, if only because of the history you cite. I think any, maybe it's unique to Georgia. I don't think so. Any of these these countries that historically have gone through uh, oppressive regimes or have been satellites tend towards this uh, self determination uh, mentality master of your own fate, whatever, uh, to a degree that doesn't really, you don't really find very much in the West. And I, I, could, def I could definitely situationally put myself in that person's shoes and just think, oh yeah, I suppose I'd, I'd feel uh, a similar way. Um, but uh, I, su I suppose you being quite young, you know, you still have time because you know, you're young, you still have time. Yes, I have time to become uh, disillusioned and disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I wasn't going to add that, but yeah, was, that, that might be that might be the right way of praising it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but well, well, okay. Uh, let's let me give you an example. Uh, there is uh, a figure, historical figure in Georgia, Eftime Tagaishvili. So I'm not going to try person? to repro uh, reproduce that. Uh, sure. But, yeah. sure. That's, uh, so, who is this person? You see, uh, when uh, the Ruskis came uh, to power uh, after, like in 19, after 1921, after they reconquered Georgia for, after our brief period of independence, well, they melted a lot of historic artifacts facts to feed the poor. Yeah, right. And uh, a seize, and well, the Georgian democratically elected government went, ran away to Paris. And um, there was this person, Ektimem, was uh, part of these people who ran away, but he was uh, supposed to guard the national treasures that uh, this uh, country 
this uh, government was supposed to take uh, away from Georgia and uh, hide it. And well, even after constant uh, pressure from his fellow Georgians to sell some of this stuff in order to fund some revolutionary activity within the USSR, he did not. Uh, he did not uh, submit to this pressure. When the Nazis were looking for these uh, uh, things, he managed to hide it. He and his wife, well, they did not have any children, but uh, he basically let his wife die and lived in extreme poverty so that he would keep these treasures and uh, <laughs> And the rationale was that this was not his own belonging. This belonged to Georgian people. Now, tell me again, how can someone look at this and not... Uh, how can you look at this? How can you hear this? And how can this not make your blood boil? Sure, there are a lot of problems. And uh, there are... Uh, there is a lot of work to be done, but, uh, well, we've had worse. <laughs> yeah, that's we have true. Had, we, have had, uh, like, we have had periods when we were under foreign rule and uh, the foreign power systematically tried to displace our population. Like, in the 17th century, one... Iranian uh, Shah, or, yeah, that's the, I guess I'm translating from Georgian, but yeah, this leader, he took some natives from parts of Georgia and took them to Peridan, this place in Iran, and started populating the uh, these parts where he took these people from with uh, ethnic Iranians and to assimilate the country. And we, and we survived that. And even to this day, these people who have been living in a foreign country for centuries already, they have retained their identity and they have retained their language. And a lot of these problems, although they seem dire, well, this unemployment rate is not that important if people can just get food for themselves, farm and get by. Everything can be uh, fixed if uh, there I if we find will in ourselves as people to uh, band together to put aside our uh, our uh, minute and minuscule differences and uh, try to unite for a common goal, which uh, has happened in the past several times. And well, if we don't find in ourselves uh, the will to do this, then I'm sorry. As much as I may love my country, I I think that then we do not deserve, we do not have earn the right to keep on living as a nation, as people. Yeah. Well, hmm. you know, I guess it. Sorry. Bit, uh, I guess it must be a bit uh, difficult uh, to understand the sentiments uh, for a global citizen. Uh, well, I don't like the term <laughs> global citizen. I'm not a global citizen. I'm just, uh, I mean, I think, uh, again, your impression of me as a sort of global progressive is, is really no, no, off the mark. Not global progressive, but a global citizen is someone who uh, does not, doesn't have a place that he calls his home. Correct. I don't have a home. That is correct. I may be in, well, I may be uh, not in Georgia. But, uh, but whatever Georgia is your home. Yeah, no, I, I totally, I get that. Uh, I, I would say that's correct. And, I don't, uh, I don't have a home. Yeah. And I have friends, for instance, who, uh, who, well, brought up, who were, who spent some parts of their childhood in one country, then some in another one, and some in another one. And if you look at, and if you talk to them, they, <laughs> they don't think of any particular one of those countries as their home. 
Mm-hmm. They have, they may have some fond childhood memories, but uh, at the end of the day, they uh, just. Uh, well, I was actually having a discussion with a, uh, a friend of mine the other day about. I mean, this is kind of tangential, or maybe it's not about the distinction between home and familiarity. And so uh, I think they are distinct uh, entities. So you, you have, or distinct uh, qualities maybe. Um, on the one hand, growing up in a certain environment would um, of necessity in time make you familiar with it. More familiar, if you grow up in environment X, you'll be more familiar with environment X than environment Y just because that's what you're familiar with. Now, the, the default position is the position that if you've grown up in environment X, the familiar environment, it is your de facto home. However, I would say that familiarity does not necessarily equate to the, um, well, you speak German, the feeling of Zuhause sein or, you know, wanting to, that feeling of being home, a feeling of belonging. In fact, I've said this before in conversations with, with Irishmen that the closest approximation I have had to feeling a sense of belonging was, uh, you know, maybe looking over the cliffs of Mohare, which are these cliffs on the west coast of Ireland, overlooking the Atlantic as waves are crashing and I'm getting sopped in the rain. Uh, and for some reason, I felt more attached to that being less familiar with the environment than I ever did growing up in the United States. So I don't think that it's an automatic that uh, you grow up in an environment and you're familiar with it, therefore it's your home. For many people, that's the case because familiarity breeds uh, a degree of, of comfort and that's what you want to reside in, presumably comfort. Um, w- what that mechanism is, you know, why there are people such as myself who are effectively orphans of the world, I don't know why that's the case. Uh, it's a bit of a mystery because such people tend to be outliers. But uh, I, now I'm, I'm familiar with certain environments more than others, and yet they're not, they're not really what I would call, quote-unquote, uh, home. So I think, uh, it, I can, I think actually, w- the, the view that you're pr- presenting is, is, a, is one that I think is much more understandable than, uh, than the view of, say, the orphan of, of the world. I can understand it because I, I, you know, most people are like that. Most people grow up in an environment and they're familiar with it and they, they run with it and that's what, what they know and that's what they would consider home. Uh, I, I can't say that that doesn't speak to me personally, but I am a, a very small minority in that regard. And as are the few people I know who are, who are like that. Um, so and I actually understand your perspective quite well. It's just that, um, if anything, it, it's it's my perspective that, or my point of view that tends to be misunderstood. Although I don't think it's essential people understand it. It's just being effectively homeless in in, a, in an abstract sense is is uh, is more difficult. And of course, it changes your view on on yes, geopolitics. I agree. It is very difficult. It must be. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's something that. I don't think you ever get rid of, because that's a human need, I suppose, this sort of longing uh, to want to maybe belong somewhere. But uh, I think everything you, after a while, and maybe it's just my age speaking, you realize that it's just an approximation. Um, and I, sure, think that, I think there is another uh, side to this equation, that yeah. it's one thing to belong to a particular place, and it's another to have a sense of historical continuity. That uh, I think uh, lately there have been some, uh, yeah, some discussions about uh, what is the national pride and whether this has some place in it. And uh, well, um, I remember looking at some uh, earlier works of historians in Georgia in this uh, beginning of the 20th century, and even then you see. Uh, the same debate happening in, uh, at least from uh, when Georgians went to Europe, at that, like, that's actually how the first Georgian university was founded. You had this, all of these people spread out, either in Russia or Switzerland or Germany or France or uh, sometimes even UK. And 
then after some time they just said okay we are going back and uh, they went and founded the first uh, Georgian University and I mean you can't just uh, <laughs> immediately uh, get such a thing out of thin air right you need a uh, faculty for this and at that time even when these people came into contact with uh, such uh, global uh, perspectives they had immediate reaction to this that uh, when, I mean, if you talk about nationality, right, and taking credit for your ancestors' uh, achievements, I can see that there are many people who do this. There are many, even among my countrymen, who uh, try to lionize their ancestors in order to, uh, <sighs> As some sort of coping mechanism to cope with their. Yeah, uh, I'm going to have to reality. compliment you. That's not a yes. word even most native speakers would use. Lionize. Well, it's impressive. Continue. Well, thank you. So, uh, our ancestors to uh, <laughs> make them more amiable than they are. Well, I, 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 I know the word. I'm saying that. <laughs> I know the word. I'm just saying that it's not sure. a word that. Uh, sure, but, uh, no, I'm trying to just show off my language skills. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Right. But, uh, but anyway, uh, yes, they try to paint their ancestors greater than they were as some form of coping mechanism for uh, the gruesome realities, the day-to-day -day realities they, that they encounter. And true, some people may use it that way, but uh, national pride is, I think, in its purest form, something a bit more different. It is this uh, looking at your history and thinking of yourself as inheritor of your ancestors legacy and well this legacy also must come with a sense of responsibility that you need you don't just sit down and uh, think put down your pen and uh, say okay i have reached the apex of uh, uh, our people's achievement and i don't therefore i don't need to do anything more this uh, being an inheritor of this legacy also uh, comes with the responsibility to add to it, to improve upon it, and to reach greater heights. Yes. So... Uh, is, that, is that the source of your seemingly, uh, I guess you could say, latent animosity towards the alt-right as a kind of uh, false advocate of, of a philosophy which, in theory, you support or you, you advocate, but they themselves fall short of? Well, to be honest, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't really have that much of uh, animosity towards uh, the ideas. It's just they are a bit amerocentric. This whole well, but here's the, here, and here's the problem, you know, when we talk about national identity or what have you. In Europe, uh, you could argue even to a lesser extent because it, you don't have this intense sort of history of conflict in Western Europe, at least in in the recent decades that you do in Georgia. But, you know, we, we often talk about, uh, quote, unquote, American identity. And, and, and I've said this, and I think you've been there. I think it's, it's a completely meaningless term. Uh, there's nothing, when something's completely undefined, you can't really talk about it, much less have pride in it or feel a sense of uh, connection to it. So... Uh, well, I guess my uh, animosity towards the alt-right can be uh, summarized as, I would term them the jackass nationalism. Jackass right. nationalism, interesting. Okay. Yes, like, uh, let's do things first, think about it later. Right. Well, if we look at uh, the nationalist movements in Georgia, how did these things happen? These people, Georgians, in the, at the beginning of, well, in the 18th century, oh no, in the 19th century, uh, Georgians were uh, under Russian rule. And uh, the, at initially there were a lot of rebellions, but then uh, Russians, in order to russify the people, they first started to take the young noblemen and try to give them education uh, abroad or in Russia as a form of, uh, well, Education as indoctrinate, but this had a side effect. This thing went rogue. Some people went abroad, came back, and realized that they had to um, 
they had to think about Georgia as a distinct entity and uh, think of its interests. And first came the ideas, then came this uh, gathering of people, and then came the movement. And in, in all rights, you see as a, some form of a pure reaction to some event, which is not thought out, and uh, they are uh, kind of tainting already uh, a somewhat uh, tainted uh, brand of nationalism in uh, the intellectual circles. Circles. Like our first president, for instance, was called provincial fascist by George Bush, the senior. So yeah, uh, this uh, I'm I'm afraid that they're going to uh, by uh, by the kind of people that they are, and by their own actions and personal shortcomings, they are going to uh, mess things up for the rest of the world because. Uh, Everything that happens in the United States sooner or later echoes throughout the world. Mm. Yeah, but I think uh, again, it's it's. I think to an American, <clears throat> as there is no the, the the meaning of being American is meaningless beyond you know I don't know printer nationalism or however you want to term it passport nationalism, or you know paper nationalism. I think I still have to disagree about that as well. So you're saying that being an American in 2018 has a concrete meaning? Uh, please enlighten me. I, I guess that's uh, not the right uh, way to approach things. Uh, being, the, You should not just look at 2018. Where is this historical sense of continuity? Well, that's that's the whole point. There isn't now. You still, you still do, and let me tell you why. So if we look at writings of uh, one of the thought leaders in the, uh, leaders in the early nationalist movement where he talks about different kinds of people, and I mean, I don't know how they would be received <laughs> by an average uh, uh, <laughs> modern revisionist uh, feminist historian. <laughs> they would, I guess, be quite inflammatory, but well, he has a passage about uh, Americans. Mm. And he says that Americans are strange people because, unlike other historical nations, they don't have any uh, solid foundation to uh, fall back to, that this is who we are, this is what makes our identity, and instead they have to look ahead into the future and put all their effort in, uh, into it. And, uh, well, also, that... Uh, Somehow, although you, you're talking like to, talking about the quote unquote founding fathers. No, I'm talking about uh, somewhere like uh, late nineteenth uh, uh, century. Yeah, but by and then that's... already the you could say the demographic composition of what the original Americans were had begun to change and shift. Sure, but even at that time, uh, this guy looked at Americans and concluded that uh, there was something more to the to being an American than just a mishmash of uh, people trying to uh, uh, be opportunistic. You uh, still have this, uh, a sense of continuity, this uh, looking into the future and uh, trying to innovate, trying to do something, trying to be active, and uh, so on. This, yeah. you could say, is in a sense, uh, at least from, was at least from that perspective, uh, something that e could be seen as... Uh, Even okay. if I were to grant that, that view, uh, I think that time, again, the, 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 it, it, it's it shifted, it's, it's changed. So if you look at the original uh, sort of composition of the United States, it was, for the most part, I mean, like, it was it. Yeah, that's what the founding fathers envisioned. Uh, I think it historically attested, you know, the sort of Anglo Northwestern European man. Then that changed and then included other types of Europeans. Then um, ever more people from other parts. Of, so, and you fast forward uh, then through the, to the late twentieth century. And the current, I'd say that we can look at we can talk about history and what was, um, but there is no longer a continuity uh, when everyone is running around with the hyphenated American title and 
Um, the more hyphens, the better. So if you are a Bolivian, Irish, Italian, Georgian, American, you get the most points. Well, maybe you're not melanated enough in that case. So you know, maybe you're an Bolivian, African, Irish, Italian, that's even better. This is not preserving continuity. And I, I would say that uh, in as much as the, the desire to pursue economic opportunity is a kind of American tradition, it's not uniquely American. I mean, people, it's just human nature. People go where there are economic opportunities to improve their lives. So the problem, I think, in the United States is there's nothing to grapple onto. Uh, as you've delineated, Georgia has a, a very, uh, you could say, um, tangible history uh, that you can you can come to grips with. Uh, it's a fairly homogenous country, etc. And whatever its flaws, you could say it's your country. In, in the case of the United States, unless you want to uh, really latch on to some increasingly ancient past. It's just not, a, none of these things are applicable. And I think the, the alt-right, it's not just that. I mean, there's the reproductive movement aspect, and we've talked about that. But it's, in the United States, because being American means nothing, apart from having been, on Ameri born, been born American soil and having a bunch of paperwork to say that you're an American citizen, that, um, that creates a, a gap and a vacuum. And into this vacuum and into this gap, uh, flood the the many identitarian uh, forms of politics that we see today, whether they're the versions of the SJWs, the furries, the fuzzies, the wuzzies, whatever, the alt-right. Um, I think this is an attempt, a subconscious attempt on the part of quote-unquote Americans, um, i.e. passport nationalists, to to get, get hold of something that is fundamentally missing in their life. Now, as much as I would describe myself as an orphan of the world, I, my polarity or my, my allegiance or my interests or my sense of continuity is best aligned with European history um, in a general sense as someone who was uh, born uh, in the United States but nonetheless... Uh, whose ancestors came from Europe and whose whose father came directly from Europe, I, I I find if I have to choose between the two, at least I can live in a place that resonates uh, more with me than um, because this is the I'm a a cultural byproduct of of this thing that called Europe rather than. Uh, well, I, 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 you could call it maybe Seven Eleven nationalism, right? So, or, or, or uh, Starbucks national. I mean, basically, to be an American is to be a consumer, which everyone is in the world, and to have been to live in the United States. That is the meaning of of America. And then, as I said, in in certainly left wing circles, the more adjectives you can add on. So, if you're a Bolivian, African, Irish, Italian, Chinese American. I mean, you're really high up there, but it's, it doesn't, I think for a lot of people, it doesn't uh, resonate. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, when you say Georgia is a homogeneous country, uh, you talk about Georgian people, right? Well, ethnic Georgians. Ethnic probably. Georgians, yes. But are you aware that ethnic Georgia also, Georgians also consist of lots of subgroups, which at least at of the course. beginning, yes, they would not have been... Uh, they would not have been the same or uh, as homogeneous as they, we are right now uh, because, uh, well, they were not that interbred. Like you have uh, well, okay, people I, in the I, mountains, you I, have people I, in uh, the of uh, course. Yes, lower parts, and you have uh, Kartlik, Aheti, Mereti, Guria, Samegrelo. Well, Raja, I'm familiar Raja. with some of these yeah, groups, and yes. I'm not denying some, their yes. existence. And some, and some of them even had their own language. Yet somehow... We, as a people, banded together and formed a country and uh, managed to coexist together as, uh, and now we are known as uh, a group of people, a same group of people, and, uh, and we are more or less the same people. 
But at one point we weren't. We were maybe tribes. We were maybe some. Uh, well, yeah, and, and, and yeah. Georgian itself yes. is part of a greater language group called the Kartvelian languages. I'm familiar with this, yes. but and no. so all of these Kartvelian tribes are basically like the same. Tribe. Well, they're, they're they, yeah, they're they have a relationship, but yes. I, I I don't disagree That's with that. But what you see now in the, what you happened then at that time in Georgia could be seen right now. To be happening in the United States is just at the uh, initial process. Uh, so you have this, no, uh, man. But the, the difference. The difference is, I mean, historically, that the various Kartvelian groups that then subsequently formed what what is a Georgian today, there there's a continuity. There they all more or less form groups that exist in the Caucasus or the Trans Caucasus or whatever or the Western sure. Trans. Um, the is, United States. They formed it. Uh, well, this uh, must have started as some form of military alliance against uh, foreign conquerors, right? So, in the United States, at least from my perspective, when I look at it, I see that people banding along this vaguely defined term of ethnicity, because uh, or uh, color, race. This race seems to be as a form of proxy for what used to be called ethnicity. It's just, uh, you have these people, well, uh, you have an Italian, you have a Norwegian ancestry, you have this uh, uh, Spanish ancestry, but well, speaks uh, does not speak Spanish, so German ancestry, and you have all of these people banding together, and uh, as a, they call it a racial group, but in effect, this is the mechanism by which uh, the uh, Georgians or the Kartvelians banded together, and uh, they formed a country called now Georgia, because... I mean, uh, there were East Georgia and West Georgia with a different uh, rulers sometimes, but they still thought of themselves as the same people. Yeah, again, I, I think what, what's happened in the United States, why things are broken down among race, because to, you know, if, you've li if you listen to discussions, I think to most Europeans, the racial thing is, is a bit incoherent because obviously there's a longer history of specific ethnicities within Europe. Um, so very few Europeans would use the term, you know, white European. That's a very American thing. But the reason why, uh, as you pointed out, it's people use race as a proxy in the United States is because uh, you have all these different groups. They're, most Americans have no connection to their past. I mean, and I'm not talking about the, the guy whose great-grandfather was Irish who decides to get drunk on St. Patrick's Day. Okay, whatever. But that's not really... <laughs> You get plenty of those. I went to university with these types. Uh, that's not really being connected uh, with the past. And um, so you have this these disparate groups. And so the, the, th the thing that, uh, in, and I'm not arguing that race is just about skin color or whatever, but, but I'm saying that you know, skin color is an easy proxy, easy, easily identifiable proxy uh, for people to focus in on. And I guess... Uh, you know, the more or less melanated you are, the, the easier it is to fit into certain groups. Um, but again, as somebody who, who grew up there, who even in the 80s, I would argue, the hyphenated American reigned supreme, that there was no, at best, there was, there was no common identity apart from physically growing up there, because you have all these different groups who... Uh, you know, you see this in in to this day. There, are, you know, conflicts between Hispanic Americans, Black Americans, Russian Americans, Jewish Americans. Oof. They all well, I'm, I'm sorry. I have to use the hyphenated American. That, that's just what it is, and they none of them really get along. And in the best case scenario, they they tolerate each other um, when they do have to interact, but they they stay they 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 keep away from each other. Now, I think that. This is symptomatic of, of humans are naturally, most people are naturally tribal. Some, there are exceptions, obviously. But when everyone is, when you don't have a common identity, um, then there's nothing left apart from consumerism. And again, you, you get these absurd forms of identity politics. So if the United States is being racked by identity politics, and I think, think it is, um, it's... There are a number of reasons for this. That's one of them. The other reason, I think, uh, from an American perspective, is that if 
uh, and I think the time has passed for this, but if the United States had wanted to enforce some notion of, quote-unquote, civic nationalism, you know, being American is about political and philosophical <laughs> principles, right? Constitutionalism, sometimes it's called. Um, that ship has sailed because nobody decided to enforce that. Uh, groups were allowed to uh, to fracture and factionalize uh, amongst each other. And um, as a consequence of that, uh, and they weren't punished for that, uh, not necessarily by law, but through social means. So everyone was allowed to become the hyphenated American they are today. Uh, so that ship has sailed. And now people are, now it's too late. So now you have people, there's a woman named Amy Chua, who's... Um, she, she writes books about politics and tribes and whatever. And, and she, I think she wrote re, her recent public is Political Tribes, and she's a Chinese-American, right? And not just any Chinese-American, a Chinese-American of Chinese descent, of, of the Chinese people who dwell in Southeast Asia, and, uh, you know, they, they're their own story. So she's really interested in the subject. She had a relative that was murdered in the Philippines. And I can't understand for the life of me why... She's still promote, promoting tribalism when she's seen that that type of tribalism has has shaken the quote unquote nation to the to its its core, and now you just have a bunch of, of uh, rootless chicken uh, headless chickens running around fighting each other about you know who gets the gibbs and 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 so I just think the United States is a lost cause. It's just done in this regard. Well, and you cannot I'm, approximate. I'm, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not making any predictions about uh, the future of the United States. I'm just drawing parallels between this process, which uh, forced the Georgians to become a single or hidden nation, and uh, of related peoples that spoke related languages in a related you, region of the world. Okay, so. Are, uh, are you claiming that uh, there's uh, so quote unquote white people don't speak English? Well, th that's well, you know, we, and, we all uh, everyone speaks English now. It's not. It's and, an uh, and also, you could say that some of them are bilingual, but you have some groups in Georgia, as I said, who had their own language. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've I've heard of some of the their, what is it, Swan and yeah, uh, Swan and Magrelian. Yeah, and there's I mean, Colchian or Zahn as well. Anyway, I'm, I'm not that familiar with, with Georgian oh, yeah, linguistics. Oh, yeah, those but, are uh, extinct. Right, so, the, okay. I mean, there's a common language, and language is obviously a common thread. So, for example, I can, I can tell you that from personal experiences being younger abroad, that uh, English speakers, whatever their origin, will band together because that they can communicate with each other, and right. if they don't know the local language, well, there you go, sure. But... Um, I'm not so sure if that's uh, that's sufficient. Uh, put, it, put it this way: the, the the Georgian experience that you're describing was something that you could almost say was a natural evolution over time uh, by people that uh, again coexisted in a geographical reason saw the benefit of that. The United States um, ethnic or demographic configuration is an artificial one. You're not going to get ever get a type of Georgian nationalism uh, in the United States. No, because, yeah, because never, it's, it, I never claimed that. But okay. uh, if, let me phrase it this way: Do you think Georgians would have banded together as a single nation had there not been any other people in the world? Let's put uh, such a lens on the word these biblical myths. Let's assume that the biblical myths are true. That all these uh, People after the flood, after the deluge, uh, yeah, they died, and only Georgians uh, sprang out, and now they are the only people populating this whole planet in Caucasia. And do you think they would have banded together had they not been constantly raided by neighboring uh, tribes and neighboring countries? Well, probably not. Obviously, there's a well. A there you go. There you go. The, it is the friction that. Uh, puts people together sometimes that like um, let's put it like this uh, if I were to draw a parallel then um, a, Amer a Russian American and an Italian American and an Anglo American I guess would uh, uh, rather deal with uh, each other than deal with uh, uh, 
well, say, people who are radically different from them. It's, it's just the mechanism. I'm not claiming any about the morality, but some parallels could be drawn. And from my perspective, it's an early stage, and it could definitely fail. Who knows? Well, well okay, yeah. I see where you're going with this. I think I do, at least. Uh, two points here. Um, I don't dispute that there's already a kind of nominal balkanization of the United States. Uh, so, yeah. And, yes, uh, people will draw allegiances uh, in accordance with things like that. And in this case, I guess you could say skin color because that's just a proxy for things. Or um, you could also have something like, uh, well, with the case of Italy, right? You have uh, Northerners versus Southerners. and uh, oh, We already had that. We, yeah, but you could, you could have like uh, something like this, but along the lines of uh, race in the future. Who knows? Well, I, no, I know, but the point is, is that, right, so you're, there is, that's the whole point, there is no, these days, American identity is meaningless, and so people, if they're going to look towards identitarianism as their salvation, and I, I'm doubtful that's any form of salvation, but uh, if they're going to do that, then they will, they will fracture and balkanize, and that's a theoretical model for the states as well, where you have just balkanized areas that would not be permitted, uh, incidentally, by the federal government, because uh, the federal government wouldn't allow that, but uh, of, of people no, just sort of existing in their own enclaves. I mean, there are already these yeah. types of enclaves. And so, but, but that's the thing. You're, what the end product of that is not a United States, that is a disunited states of, or a, a fractured states of America um, that couldn't really be called a coherent nation. And... I think that the American project, this what idea about of, Byzantium. well, I suppose you could call it that too. It it has failed, or maybe the Holy Roman Empire, where you know there are yes. widely disparate uh, ethnicities and cultures and, and languages included in it. The, we need to concede in in the current year that the American project has failed. That there is no actual American identity, and that people will probably balkanize and fracture into their own splinter groups. They're already doing it. And, and it doesn't need to be just racial. I mean, look at the identity, look at the type of sort of left versus right politics, which is so extreme these days. Um, that's another form of, uh, of political tribes, right? So, uh, you know, it, it, you have a bunch of, uh, you could say, axiomatic beliefs in, in, in on each side, mostly on the left, of the things you talk about and the things that you don't talk about um, and the things that are important, sort of... Um, what I call arbitrary value uh, preferences. And that's another form of, of tribalism, and, and that can actually supersede, in many cases, um, the, the melanation of an individual. But everywhere I look in the United States, I just see uh, chaos and disharmony and disunity. So um, I don't really see a good solution to this. Uh, I don't really think anyone has a good solution. But whatever hope you have for Georgia, that is not a hope that you can kindle in the disunited oh, no, states I'm of not, America. <laughs> I just made parallels about it. Well, there again, are, uh, there, of course, and there are parallels between 2018 and the last decades of the Roman Empire, too. It doesn't mean that they're identical. Parallels are just sure, parallels. Sure, sure, sure. It's just a parallel. I, right. I said that there could be something that uh, one could claim is uh, uh, an analog of uh, what... Who, of what the Georgians have for well, not exactly. No, I claim that there was something which could be claimed to be an American identity. Well, it would not be I, as the same as Georgian identity because, uh, well, for once uh, there is a difference in time periods and uh, duration. But yeah. uh, I just claim there is something that could uh, theoretically well, there, qualify as identity. There was, as I said, there was this no. There was a, a brief notion of sort of constitutionalism, adherence to uh, uh, you know the principles of the founding fathers, and 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 there was a, a degree of adherence to that for a while at least. It's just that uh, I, I'm of the view that I'm not going to pretend that I am an American unless I'm. I I will I will say yes in in the passport nationalism sense I'm an American. Um, just because there's no good description of what an American is other than somebody, unless you want to use that description, somebody who's born in the United States, okay, that's an American. That doesn't tell you anything. And um, so I just refuse to, to use that terminology. And uh, people have given up on the sort of 
constitutional, philosophical nationalism that was a thing for a while at least. No, but there is a bit of a difference here. You see, if uh, we are flatmates in a big uh, flat, a big uh, like uh, shared flat with lots of residents, and you uh, come to the kitchen one day and you are. Uh, and we know all, all know each other. You're going to come to the kitchen one day, and uh, it stinks because I just cooked uh, this Georgian version of French stinky cheese, which is uh, just basically rotten cottage cheese. You're not going to think, "Oh, what a fucking liberal," or "What a." I don't know liberal. anything so, about Georgian cuisine. I'm sorry, for ignorance. <laughs> sure, sure, but you're not going to think that "Oh, fucking liberal" or "fucking conservative." You're uh, going to think "Fucking Georgians." Wait, can I just say, am I, if I'm not familiar with Georgian cuisine, and if we consider Georgians minorities, does that make me a racist? I'm trying to think. Uh, well, I don't know. It depends on how it, uh, how it benefits my country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll uh, veer towards saying I'm, I'm actually a racist because I'm not familiar with Georgian cuisine. I'm sorry. Uh, that, shame on you. Well, I, it is when, my when I, was shame. Com- when I was coming to the West, I had this idea that uh, it was for uh, everyone and everyone would be super accepting and accommodating. And I come here and I hear these racist insinuations. It's like, I'm deeply disappointed. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to try to work on my, I'm going to become familiar with Georgian cuisine and in the process, uh, reduce my racism. It might take a while though. Sure. But, well, if you want some help, you can always <laughs> ask me. I can just Google pictures, uh, you know. That's that's sure. how I become truly informed. What is sure. this called? Kuchmachi? Kuch, kuchma- uh, kuchmachi. Kuchmachi. Okay. Chicken livers, hearts, gizzards with walnuts and pomegranate yes. seeds. Now, that looks absolutely lovely. Um, well, that is a, actually, there is some regional difference. Like, if the, you look at the East Georgian cuisine, it's more meaty. There is more meat in that. Or if you look in the mountains, and if you look at uh, uh, this uh, west, and uh, hmm. then it is more uh, vegetarian than vegan friendly. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm I'm going to, at some point in time, embark on the great journey of purging myself of racism towards Georgians by familiarizing myself with the uh, oh. uh, cuisine. Oh. Mentioned we have some of this uh, spice that only only we have. Not spice, but I mean, but get, sauce. getting back to the main point, I think yeah. I think at the national level, uh, it's obvious why the the political uh, <clears throat> entities are not talking about this out loud. But well, of course, uh, there 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 is a huge American identity crisis precisely because there is no identity now. Um, whatever lip service paid. The, the ship has sailed, and if the ship has sailed, then you will ha- need to find some new ship. Now, I don't think it's enough just to be a consumer for most people, at least. And, um, yeah, maybe maybe the disunited States of America is is going to be the future. Uh, I don't, I mean, you got like Jared Taylor, for example, talks a lot about separatism, and in theory, there's nothing preventing groups of people. So, for example, if the alt right wants to found, uh, and I talked about except this, the government, because no, 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 no. Actually, the government. So you could power. take. Let's say the alt right wants to create their their ethno state. So they could go to a place in Wyoming, found a town. They could make de facto make it all white. They could put social pressure there such that non whites weren't accepted there. If that's what they wanted. These, these things are still uh, possibilities. Um, uh, well, would you think that uh, this would be permissible because of the growing, uh, so well, growing power grabbing nature of the state? Because they want to control increasing <sighs> all aspect of uh, our lives and. Uh, uh, it, it might still be. Uh, I don't really know. Uh, my oh. view of the United States is a dismal one. I don't think there's really any... The, the future of, of the United States is the disunited states of 10,000 different identities. Um, or 10 Did million. I mention that uh, United States breaking up is diametrically opposed to my country's interests? Uh, well, <laughs> because what? Because then, what is going to keep Russia from just invading? And uh, <laughs> yeah, there's this con- this theory that if the United States were to lose its geopolitical power, that somehow 
Russia would say, we're going to invade Georgia and the Baltics all over again. I don't know. I mean, well, I don't know if that's a safe assumption. Um, we might need uh, to consult Alexei on this one as our resident Russian expert, but um, uh, sure. uh, maybe that's the case. I don't think so. I, I think... But, uh, well, in Georgia's case, it's that we have some oil uh, pipes. Oh, yes, right. So right. I guess they would want to take control of those. Well, right, but that was part of the, the Nazi campaign uh, of, I think, for, was it 41, uh, I believe? Uh, maybe it was 42. Anyway, of, of, of moving in that direction. They never got there, but still. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, it, it, to me, I guess it seemed, well, I mean, Georgia is, geopolitically, if, if we think about it, right? Uh, Georgia is right now... Uh, in between American and Russian uh, ideological warfare, right? But uh, there is also a third threat, threat, Turkey. Because lately Turkey has been uh, giving education to the Northern Caucasian Muslim population. Right. And they, have to, they try to get the same kind of influence as, uh, uh, say, Americans have in Georgia right now uh, in this... Uh, Muslim population, and well, <laughs> if uh, well, Russia is usually viewed as a monolith, right? But uh, in, in reality, it's just a federal republic with its uh, sub countries who are completely different from what an ordinary average Russian stereotype is. Oh, absolutely. And, I mean, yeah. they, so you know. if anything, uh, Russia has, uh, I guess, a bigger chance of balkanization than uh, <laughs> anything. Uh, well, I mean, but here, here's the thing is that there's a, there's a critical difference here, and I'm not an expert on Russia, but take, for example, the, <clears throat> the sub-Russian country of Yakutia, which I'm more familiar with oh. than, than others. That's an example. Uh, they are a Turkic-speaking Mongoloid people with no pretension of being "quote unquote" ethnic Russians, and yet uh, nobody uh, is going to get angry about that. They're still incorporated within the Russian Federation. The critical difference between multi-ethnic components within Russia, and there are many, as you pointed out, Tatars, uh, Yakuts, etc., uh, etc., et um, is that. Russians don't maintain a pretense that they're all the same or that they're Russian. And so there isn't a united federation of Russia in as much as there is a, uh, a series of, you could say, states that have a relationship with each other where people tolerate each other to some degree, at least. Uh, I'd have to disagree to a certain extent because uh, there is this phenomenon of Russification. They want to... Uh, submit well, they, they are uh, Russified uh, to some degree yeah, because every yeah. every most uh, people say citizens of Yakutia will mm. speak the, the the Turkic language Yakut and will speak Russian and they're bilingual basically. That's so Rus Russification is absolutely a thing and, and yeah. it always has been. And also, this northern Muslim population of Caucasia has a beef to peak with Russian authorities historically. Well, okay, because, but again, again, yeah. Russia Russification aside, and I'm not disagreeing that there's been mm -hmm. a Russification in, in uh, certainly a linguistic one. That's basically it, uh, yeah. or the major factor is that <clears throat> um, despite that, uh, nobody in Moscow, or nobody. Nobody has the, the, the pretense that there is an overarching Russian identity and that everyone from, from Lake Baikal to Yakutia to Vladivostok to north of Georgia to Moscow, they all share this. Whereas there's a pretense and a lie told the United States that every American has this common origin and common commonality that is, I would argue, would be is as much a lie as if you were to say that everyone in the Russian Federation is Russian. That's the critical difference. Russians aren't claiming that y Yakut people from Yakutia are Russian or that Tatars are Russian. Or, I mean, they live within the confines of it and, ma and many of them are bilingual. Um, it, there's a, and I think that's the fundamental difference. Nobody is claiming to for, for, that they are something they are not. In the United States, there is a claim, and in Canada as well, that everybody is Canadian-American, despite having but, nothing uh, in common. Aren't these people more or less segregated, then? 
um, in the Russian Federation or in the United yes, States? Yes, in the Russian Federation. Uh, they are largely segregated, but yeah, I... and they and you don't have large government schemes to uh, try, which talk about representation and which talk about uh, diversity and so on. You don't have a forced integration from the uh, state from the uh, government. No, no. Which, that, that, that's another, have it in the United States. Right, but the United, that's, that's the pretense, is it not? That's the pretense sure. that everyone needs to get along uh, in this so-called uh, melting pot and that everyone has uh, these common interests and common origin and common whatever. Um, that's the difference. Yeah, they're not, but, they're not forced together. Yeah. But isn't there... Uh, I don't know. I kind of had the impression that... Uh, there is some sort of underlying premise in all of this that, uh, say, behind every, well, uh, behind, well, under the skin of every tanned Georgian, <laughs> there is, uh, there lives a very disciplined Anglo. Uh, Something li along the lines of that. Do you mean that, that the, the eternal Anglo lives and lives on in, in every American, whatever the no. American's origin? No, uh, is that, uh, like, I don't know how true this is, but, uh, uh, well, at least uh, the Russian literature tried to demonize Columbus to a certain extent, and uh, they, one of the books that I read in my youth was uh, saying that when he went to Cuba, modern day Cuba, he looked at people and said, oh, these people are uh, quite, uh, well, they're not exactly white, but they're bright-skinned enough, they would make perfect Christians. <laughs> okay. This was a phrase, and uh, I don't know how true this is, uh, but uh, I think there is uh, some form of similar sentiment when uh, everyone has to be American, everyone has to be Russian, everyone has to be like German, everyone has to be British, everyone has to be French. Uh, mm. Maybe there is some failure to acknowledge the innate differences of uh, people. In, in well, let's look well, at this. I, I, my my view on this is that you can, I mean, I, you can we can qua you can uh, quibble about the details, but you know, I I don't. I think the Russian model isn't necessarily a bad one in that you sure. just have people. You know, I'm a non-German living in Germany. And I don't need to, uh, I, I suppose, falsely uh, claim I'm something that I'm not in order to live here in a peaceful or harmonious fashion, uh, for example. Um, the, the demand to, for an all-encompassing uh, inclusivity um, is, I think, has largely been uh, destructive. Because yes, it, that's uh, yeah. That's exactly it. like Russians. I mean, in Russia, you have uh, a lot of inequality. Like Moscow is, you could claim, and large cities. This urbanization is a very Soviet thing. Like you have similar trends in Bulgaria and also in Georgia, where a quarter of the population lives in one large city, and of the whole country. And uh, like uh, you have these very rich places, and you have this. Uh, Places of in Russia which could be, uh, by all metrics, called uh, shitholes from uh, a, a Moscow resident pers perspective. But uh, the point is, these people just keep to themselves. They they don't care. I mean, you you don't have to have an iPhone. You don't have to have a MacBook. You can just go on with your day to day life. And then who are you to come to me? And tell me that if I want to uh, be a shepherd in the mountains and live my life as a shepherd, that I am somehow failure and inferior, and uh, like I have to go and get myself an education, get myself a degree, and get a bank loan, and get uh, myself some property to contribute to the economy of something, something, yeah. something, yeah. That's uh, well, yeah. But again, this is a failing on the part of the United States, uh, which um, where economic prosperity is is the the thing that you strive for, and that's what makes you an American. Um, I, I think that 
there were there have been so many critical er errors committed in the course of the United States, particularly in the 20th century, that it's it will be impossible to course correct this stuff. It's it's done. Basically, the, as I said, I, my view is that the United States is done. Same for Canada. Uh, well, and I don't know. I will see. I mean, history has shown us many different turns. Well, I mean, I don't mean done in the sense that there's going to be a nuclear apocalypse, but what I mean is that the disunited states of America is is here to stay. Um, and oh, okay. Maybe. That, that model of being, of, of, of uh, friction-ridden identity politics, whether it's purely political or ethnic or racial or any mix of the above, that's, that's the name of the game for the foreseeable future. Um, and in that sense, if I were Georgian or, well, if I were Georgian, well, my ancestor came from Georgia 40,000 years ago, so I'm going to call myself an honorary Georgian, actually. <laughs> oh, they will come and speak the language and everything then. <laughs> I, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will become mag magic basically dirt. basically Georgian. <laughs> magic haplotype dirt. Um, but uh, I, you know... Then I would I think there's more hope in that sense because at least people are not going to uh, fight over over who is what and what is what because there's a admittedly like I said you could say the Cartvelian alliance whatever you want to call it but yeah closely related peoples that 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 seem to to get along and have a common interest I I don't see that fate in the United States or or in the Canada for that matter. I don't know what's going to happen in continental Europe. Um, certainly not Western Europe, because Western Europe is 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 it might be too late actually for Western Europe to uh, to to fix some of these uh, problems, um, because for some reason, as I said, uh, why people have this issue with just saying saying that I live in country X but I'm not X. Well, I don't see why that's a, a problem. Uh, oh, why that is a problem? Well, again, if I... I... I'll tell you why it is a problem. In Georgia, we have some ethnic minorities, right? Right. If you ask Azerbaijanis and Armenians, and if you ask them, where is their home country? Is it Azerbaijan or is it Georgia? It is Azerbaijan. Okay, fair enough. That's, that's the problem. Like, the, being a Georgian is not uh, a matter of uh, just uh, your uh, origins. It is also your personal choice, to a certain extent. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, you, if you do not, if you yourself do not wish to be a Georgian, then how can I, uh, like, force you to be one, right? Or if you do not wish to be a um, German, how can I force you to be one or a French man or so on. I guess uh, the underlying uh, premise here is this uh, social trust that if you if you are if you see yourself as a citizen of this country, you try to improve it to a certain extent instead mm -hmm. of being a passive bystander. And uh, maybe people just don't want. Maybe people have an issue with passive bystanders. Bystanders. Well, I mean, I don't. I don't know. It's just, uh, uh, I could see why people would uh, have some trust issues with uh, opportunists in this case. Yeah, and I think, again, I, I just, I don't have a, a rosy view politically of the, of the United States or really of the, of the, of, of the species. That's a kind of somewhat separate issue, somewhat. Um, but I think that at least, uh, at least you you know you know that you're you're Georgian, um, and you've got that uh, going for you. And I, I suppose that's something. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Or you have a home, as it were. Um, yes. And, and and it's more, and because of the history, it's more than just a home based on familiarity. It's a home based on um, a long-standing uh, history, and that can you know be traced back millennia, etc. That's uh, it's not a bad thing, I suppose. Um, but the Georgian solution uh, won't be the the solution uh, to the United States because the United uh, States is a, is a different animal. Uh, that's uh, 
that's actually why we have most of the problems right now that people think that the Danish solution is uh, this uh, is going to work in Georgia or Swedish one is going to work work with Georgia without taking into account the um, these details, these intricacies of uh, well, there are differences. You cannot try to have the same uh, policies without a rich country. As in Sweden. Oh yeah, absolutely. In, yeah, um, but there's also a reason. Though, I'd imagine you don't have mass. You know, when the when the beleaguered peoples of the world wanted to enter in Europe, um, a lot of them just kind of skipped over well, places like Hungary and Poland yeah. because there's not a lot of money there. Some of them do come to Georgia, but usually these are not on permanent or as refugees. They just come and uh, hmm. either to spend money or something, and people have problem even with them. Because yeah. people are not used to quick changes, usually. Yeah. And uh, on, on the other hand, also there is another historic uh, perspective that if you see your country getting flooded by a lot of Persians, you have this disconnect, dissonance, that on one side, your whole history has been trying to get free from these people, and suddenly you have uh, these people at your doorstep. And you're like, what? What's going on? I, I, I guess there's also that. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, but but again, uh, different challenges. Uh, but sure, uh, I, I think that at the very least, you have something that you can look back on, um, in the sense that the United States that doesn't have that, neither does does Canada, um, and. It's. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen exactly, and I. I just. I just. I just as I increasingly act, as I said, I call it the disunited states of America. There's no. There's no common identity. So uh, yeah, but <clears throat> I don't live there, and I. Uh, you know, for reasons I've cited, and uh, I have no intention of living there. So I guess in some sense it's not really my problem. Uh, I'm more concerned about Europe to varying degrees, but uh, somewhat so concerned you're about like, uh, hmm? Goethe. You're like Goethe. Your home is where you live well. <laughs> uh, is it? <laughs> well, I live better in Europe than I. Um, but I, I didn't come to Europe as an economic migrant. I mean, I, sure, it's true sure. that I. I Life is more affordable for me in Europe sure, than in the United living States. Well is, living well is not just about money and economics now, is it? No, I mean, I, I, I just feel more connected culturally to, to yes. what, what lives, what in theory lives on in Europe than uh, the disunited states of America. I mean, uh, it's, there's no question of where I, I feel in terms of degree more of a sense of belonging it's not it's not in the that strange country that apparently i was born in um but you know it, it's a question of degree uh I, I still would say i don't actually have a home but that's not i'd rather have an approximation of where i live well as you put it or as good i don't remember good saying that but then again it's been a while um and yeah but Again, for Americans, this this will continue to be a problem, and um, I don't see any solution in sight. Uh, not the least of which, for the reasons I've cited, that no one in the mainstream wants to address this issue, which is a huge issue. That um, be, there's no meaning to be an American uh, at all, uh, and so um, you can't draw on the history because not everyone shares a common history. Um, you can't draw on the language increasingly because English is becoming the bastard tongue of the world. Uh, you can't draw on the legal system because increasingly people don't even believe in the Constitution or anything like that. So what do you draw on? You, know, you just you just fracture into your individual factions and you just fight uh, each other for the gibs and the goodies. Um, good luck with that. I'm, I'm glad that I'm, I don't have to at least directly bear witness to that. <laughs> Most of it is just through internet memes and, and nonsense, but um, I... As an occasional shitpost invasion. Uh, yes, the, the, 
the the edge the shit at shit poster edge lord from the United States of which there are many you you, you get a lot of that but um, yep I I don't. I don't want to say it's completely irrelevant to me because uh, the United States is it's an important political power but I I just how can you you can only keep the uh, the lid on the can uh, for so long and at some point in time it can explode and people's fear of discussing these issues out in the open is just going to make the, all these problems uh, worse and, and worse so uh, with that said uh, we've talk, been talking for quite some time. Hope we learned a little bit about Georgia. Um, we didn't uh, get into some of the more ancient history. I, I, my suspicion was people wouldn't be interested in that, although I find that interesting, but still. <laughs> we, yes, that's, I guess, for, more, uh, for the nerd cast. <laughs> for for, the, for I, the, the, the nerd cast, which is a, a, uh, an ethnic group unto itself, you could say. Oh, really? <laughs> the, the, the nerd cast, they have their own their own genealogy and own history yeah but Oof. uh yeah i think uh we covered some of the basis and it was a uh, an interesting discussion and it's always interesting as well to look at the lack of parallels between the disunited states uh, of america and countries that actually have some sort of history and, and culture um and uh, yeah that's uh as well as the intermediaries. Increasingly, Germany is becoming a kind of intermediary state state between, you could say, the, ex the extreme of what Georgia represents in terms of that and the extreme lack of representation of cultural continuity in the United States. So, yeah. Everyone, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I might be able to get our big brain Nibba Georgian on to discuss mathematics at some point in time. I've noticed some people have requested Oof. that. Do you uh, want people to commit suicide or something? Well, there are there have been people who have expressed an interest in that, uh, but you know we, we could we could plan that out privately and, and I guess the <laughs> details. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, oh. I will uh, I'll leave it uh, here and uh, for everyone who uh, had took the time to listen to this, uh, I appreciate it, and uh, I will check you out later assuming I'm still alive and assuming the world continues to uh, turn on its axis. Um, until the next time. If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.